My family is Métis. My father was Cree and my mother Irish. And um, we were raised in sort of a, a traditional Métis home. Now, my father came from a family of 12 living children. And my aunt, I was very close to. I, uh, I probably spent more time with her than I did at my own home. And my aunt always lived close. She didn't have children of her own, but her and her husband, Pat, uh, pretty much adopted me as their own. My aunt was very, uh, very influential in my life. She told me stories about her life, and the, uh, the main, one of the main stories she talked about, which influenced her greatly in her life, was the years that she spent at the tuberculosis sanatorium. Sanatoriums, hospitals, mental asylums, and jails. There are a lot of ghost stories attached to these places, and no wonder, countless people have died in them. Today we meet Yvonne and Carol, two women who visited institutions with histories of death and who left them with their own stories of ghostly encounters. When Ottawa's Yvonne Boyer goes to a sanatorium, she just wants to connect with her beloved aunt's past, but the past she connects with turns out to be dark and terrifying. She got sick and she said that her dad took her to the doctor and the doctor told her that she had to go away to the tuberculosis sanatorium. <laughs> she said she was so sick that she didn't think that she was going to live and what she contracted was spinal tuberculosis. And uh, so she was 14 years old when she went there, and she remained there until she was 22 years old. And she said that she made many friends there. She also talked about the dark side of, of being there, because she talked about, she didn't get into it too much, but she talked about experiments that the, the doctors would sometimes do on some of the children by deflating their lungs and seeing if they could inflate them again. She also talked about how sad it was sometimes when her friends would all of a sudden be moved downstairs to the floor below because she knew they would never come back and they would die and she'd never see them again. So in many ways, it was very sad. She saw a lot of sadness and a lot of death and a lot of sickness during her time. Well, what brought me to the sanatorium was I had an opportunity to go to a conference. And I jumped at the opportunity because my the stories that my aunt had told me about her years spent there were very vivid in my mind. But uh, my aunt had, uh, had died a few years before, so she was no longer alive during the time that I actually went. So Erin, my daughter, came with me on the trip. We jumped in the car and we arrived there. And when you're driving up to it, it's a very, it's this really scary looking place. It was built in, uh, I think it was 1920, and walking up into it, you just got a feeling that there was something that was really either unpleasant or something that was unsettled. Walking through the doors kind of made you feel as if you're, you're small. The whole place carried a very creepy feeling. It was, it was scary. And uh, it was scary for my daughter. It was something that she'll never forget. Erin and I walked in, and it looked as if there should have been a lot of people in there, but there wasn't. There was only one person in there, and it was an Aboriginal man sitting off in the corner by himself. So when I, when I walked in, uh, my daughter and I walked over to the man that was sitting in the corner and he was looking troubled and he was looking pensive.
my aunt had uh, had died a few years before, so she was no longer alive during the time that I actually went. The whole place carried a very creepy feeling. There was a man, an Aboriginal man, sitting over there all by himself in an overstuffed armchair, and he was looking kind of pensive, and and... And I walked up to him because I wanted to know if he was part of the group or if he was was uh, there, working there, or, or who he was. And when I introduced myself to him, I asked him if he was part of the group that I was coming to, to the conference for. And he didn't answer me, but he looked at me and said, She's... I saw her. And I said, Who? Who did you see? And at that point, I'm holding my daughter's hand and I can feel her stiffen beside me and, and her eyes getting big. And because he was, the feeling about him as well was very troubled. It was, it wasn't very comfortable being around him. And especially when, when he said, and she's not supposed to be here. Then he got up and he walked away. He just walked off down the hallway and I didn't see him again. So I don't know, to this day, I don't know who he was, what he was doing there or other than it scared me and it scared my daughter. And uh, that sort of set the tone for the rest of the, the, the visit there. When Aaron and I, we, we stayed in the common room to read until we were getting a little bit sleepy. And then we decided that it was time for bed and probably the sooner we went to bed, the sooner the day would come and we could have some daylight. Walking to the room, it felt as if there was something hanging over, like a cloud. Our room was in the back side of the building, but Aaron and I weren't real comfortable when we went to bed, and we were a little, we were a little bit scared. It wasn't a comforting room like you wanted to like, jump under the covers and cuddle. It was, it was like, how much time do I have to spend in here? And. We crawled into bed, we had our clothes on. When we first laid down there, I felt her stiff as a board. You, know, you hear about people being scared stiff? Well, she was scared stiff. And she was right as close as she could possibly get to me. And I'm just falling asleep, and I heard the voices saying, Yvonne, Yvonne, you're here, you're here, Yvonne. I could hear them, the voices moving. It sounded like they were right outside the window. And they were moving away. They were looking for me. And then I hear tap, 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 tap. I'm thinking, tap, tap? Those are the pipes. What's going on? And then I remembered what my aunt had said. She said that after lights were out, when she was a patient there, how they communicated with each other was tap tapping on the the pipes it was hot water heating so you could tap tap on the pipes and they had some sort of a morse code that they could communicate with each other the patients so i heard this tap tap and i thought well that can't be happening there's, there's nobody here to be tap-tapping away on these water pipes. And so the tap-tap got a little more urgent, and it went tap-tap-tap, like, listen to me, tap-tap-tap. You're supposed to be knowing what I'm telling you. Oh, boy. And and then it started getting louder and louder, and then more, more closer together, like tap-tap, screaming at me. And it was like somebody's trying to communicate, and they're, they are... are they're not getting through to me, and they're urgent. Something's going on that, that they want me to know about. And then Aaron woke up and said, Mom, what's going on? What's going on? And I said, I don't know. 
I don't know what's going on, but I'm really creeped out here. <laughs> she says, Mama, Mama, she started to cry. I said, let's go, let's go then. And so we jumped up and I got a hold of her. We got our bags. We fortunately had our clothes on and we left. There was something there. There was definitely something there. There was a desperation of somebody or something trying to communicate with me. And it was the, 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 not, the tapping, tap, 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 tap. Somebody, something was trying to communicate with me. And I was not going to sit around to find out exactly what that was. Yvonne's sanatorium is an example of the experimental TB hospitals of 100 years ago. Our expert, Dr. David Reed, tells us patients were often put on total bed rest. Sometimes their feet didn't touch the floor for years. They might be subjected to medical experiments as well that included removing organs or being given untested drugs. Dr. Reed adds that ghosts are often reported in such places of intense suffering. But hospitals aren't the only institutions with supernatural stories. When Carol Grant visits the Cornwall Jail, she hopes to see one of its rumored ghosts. But what she ends up seeing terrifies her. I'm actually on the board of uh, Women Entrepreneurs. I'm the past chair, and one of our board members is the administrator, uh, if you will, at the jail. The Cornell Jail is known to be haunted. I didn't know a lot. I, I'd always wanted to go, and Halloween, and, and they predominantly they have uh, Halloween haunted walks, and I always said, oh, I'm going to go on one of those. And then when she said the meeting's going to be at the jail, I was quite excited because I said, so I'm going to go there and I'm going to see something. The meeting was for 5.30. I was running a little late because of my children and getting there. And when I pulled up, it was getting dark. The jail is lit up. There's a couple spotlights shining on it. Yeah, it's a beautiful, old, monumental, historic building. And again, coming up, I, I parked at the back because I was the last one to arrive. I had to park near the back door. And I was off to myself, all in the back. And I walked around, and I was a little nervous going in because I thought, ooh, there's going to be ghosts and spirits here, and I didn't know what to expect. But coming up to the jail, it was just a little bit eerie, but I looked around, and I saw it's a, it's a beautiful building, and that's all I thought. And I went in with my mind on the meeting. I was nervous I, because I didn't know, you know, fear of the unexpected. I, I was nervous, but receptive, and, and I was open. Even as soon as I got to the jail, when I walked in, there was this very strong smell, and it was urine, it was, it was body sweat, it was just gross smelling, and I could smell the, the men. It was very strong and, and almost nauseating to the point where like, my eyes were almost watering. And then we did the meeting, and on the way down, you have to go through the same hallway. And if you turn to the right, there's uh, there's just cells. And the third cell, I see somebody, and she's not alone. I could smell the, the men. It was very strong and, and almost nauseating to the point where like, my eyes were almost watering. And then there are, I believe there are four or five cells, but very, very tiny cells. And the third cell, I just... I see somebody very tiny, petite. She had black hair, straight. She had been reading. And I could see she's not alone. There's, there's another person with her. She was a big, mean woman and curly. Couldn't see her face. I could see wrists. The ch there was a chain on the wrist. And I saw it around the neck, this tiny little neck. I didn't see anybody with her, helping her or trying to fight with her. She killed her. Then 
I started to get afraid, and I thought, I, I want to leave. I can't process this right now. I can't deal with this. It was scary, but it, it was also invigorating because it, it was the first thing that I experienced. So I wanted to know more. I wanted to see more. Then we continued the tour, and you go around the corner, and there's another row of cells. And these are very small cells. These are one person, almost like solitary confinement. I don't know why I was drawn, but I was drawn to the one cell. This one particular room had the one bed and a little toilet, and I could smell again the urine, and I could smell just the men. It, it was very manly smell. I said, this poor man. I could see him, and he was like he was real. It looked the same. I don't think they've painted or I don't think they've renovated because the cell was the same. I just saw this man with a beard, slim built. He was in the corner on the bed at, against that wall. And in the common area, they were all sitting there eating and they were all laughing at him. And he, he was outcast. He ridiculed that he was teased that he He's traumatized, he's tormented. This poor man, I just, I can't get his head, his picture out of my head. It's just sad. Then at that point, I, I almost like a flash, I looked down and I saw his wrist. He was looking at his wrist and they were bleeding. This gentleman, he killed himself. It was that traumatic that he killed himself. And I couldn't imagine going through that. Like first being in jail and, and secondly, that you're that tormented by the people that you actually killed yourself. And I felt pity for this man and I, I felt sorry for him. And I and I think that's like almost, I, I said, gee, I wish I could have helped him. And I, I think that's why I was there to help him. So I was overwhelmed, very overwhelmed. I was actually tired too. I, I just, I was drained. That's the point I said, okay, I'm done, I, I'm good, we can go home now, I, I've seen enough. I was afraid at that point. So we left and I walked out and I was parked at the back by myself. I was a little scared. When I went back there, I looked at the window and then in the window I see that, that same man that slit his wrist, the dark hair, the beard. I thought, okay, why are you there? He was in the window. That man was standing there in the window. So that's when I thought, okay, that is a ghost. He's really standing there and he's staring at me and he wants to tell me something, but I'm not sticking around. I'm leaving and I bolted. I just, I was petrified. I was shaking. It was the same man though. It was that same guy that slit his wrist and that was freaky. <laughs> According to our experts, the jailhouse ghosts Carol describes may be there because they were so tormented in life. But they say it's not just suffering that creates supernatural activity. Ghostly sightings also increase with the number of people that have died in a place. So buildings like Yvonne's sanatorium and other TB hospitals would report many supernatural encounters. Indeed, Kentucky's Waverly Hills Sanatorium, where thousands of people died, is considered one of the most haunted places in North America. With all the suffering and death in the institutions they visited, it's no wonder Carol and Yvonne had ghostly stories to tell. Definitely somebody was trying to tell me something. And I don't know if the connection was through my aunt, who had spent so much time there, and it was the, the departed souls and spirits of the people that had died there that never had their stories told. My aunt was able to tell me her story of her of her life there. And maybe the people that didn't get an opportunity to wanted me to tell their stories too. Yeah, I am a lot more open. The, uh, the experience has changed me. Uh, it's changed the way I look at things too. Now I actually stop and when I go to places like cemeteries or visit to you know, a nursing home, I work in a nursing home too. I actually, when I'm around certain places like the chapel and I, I actually just stop and I, I look around and I feel, do I feel a breeze? Do I feel something? Do I sense something? And I'm more aware of 